everybody. Welcome to Muse TV. And we are back with uh, the, doc the the director of this great documentary, The Accidental President, which overlooks the uh, 2016 presidential campaign between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Uh, director James Fletcher, how are you doing, man? Hey, thanks for having me, Michael. So tell me the premise. How did everything get started for you and why this topic in order to make a documentary? Well... <laughs> 2016 came and went, as you well remember, everyone says that the election, Hillary Clinton's going to win. Don't worry, the world's not that crazy. You know, all good stuff. Donald Trump wins. He becomes the president. And what normally happens when people start the presidency is a period of settling in the first hundred days, how you're going to lead and all that good stuff. And of course, what actually happened was from day one in the presidency, he behaved just the same as he did on the campaign trail, uh, which meant that there was this barrage of information on a daily basis and people didn't have the opportunity to look back at the election and what had happened and why did this candidate that everyone was easily going to win it not win it and so on and so forth so that made me think maybe there is an opportunity here to look at those things because I think we all have to know our history in life and whether you love or hate Trump it, it behoves all of us to understand why he got elected. And here's the thing that I really love is that you got a lot of people to be a part of this documentary, people you wouldn't think would even want to talk about it. They came up and they talked to you. How was it getting those people? Uh, because like, I mean, shoot, you got, um, what's, her, what's her, the, the leader of CPAC. Um, can't uh, Matt Schlapp. Yeah, Matt Schlapp. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, the thing was, the, the thing was, I was approaching it. Don't forget, I'm, I'm not an American. I don't have a vote. So I was looking at this from the outside. And I always said I wanted to try and be as fair as possible. So, you know, where Trump did things right and he succeeded, I say so. Where Hillary Clinton did things wrong, I say so. Because you can't form an analysis of what happened in 2016 if you just, you know, airbrush out certain details or bit inconvenient um, and the other thing is that the, the Trump subject matter you know is something everyone has an opinion on no one says oh you know I haven't thought this through I don't really know I haven't got anything to say so whether you're, you're for Trump against Trump in the middle doesn't really matter uh, almost any, anyone you talk to you know back in time even to the present day if you say do you have an opinion on Donald Trump I know many people who say hmm haven't really thought about that let me, uh, let, me let me come back to you yeah, exactly. And you got a great interview with Kellyanne Conway, and it really yeah. shows the strategy and what the thinking was during that time, during the presidential election in 2016. Uh, how was it talking to her? What insights did you find out that were different, especially being not being in, from the country? And really well, do you know what was great was we had, you know, we, we were told we'd have 15 minutes, and it went much longer than that, because my, my selling point on the interview was to say, we're not looking to push you around cable news style. We actually want to hear from you, Kellyanne, and for you to tell us your version of events. And I very much leave it to the viewer to decide what he thinks. And that's how I approached all the interviews, which is not to come with my own agenda, but to say to anyone, please tell me what you think of you know, the following subjects, whether it's polling or Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or how the media reacted. My job was just to ask people for their version of events. And that's what I like about the documentary is the fact that it really breaks down the whole incident. It's not just certain pieces or selected pieces. It breaks down the whole incident. And that's what I love is the fact that it did that. Um, one of the things like I love about this is that it really shows how much like it makes me believe even more that he didn't want to win, that this was a propagandist. This is something that he wanted to push himself. And that he just happened to build the subs war that really touched people and it pushed him to the presidency. And um, yeah. especially his use of Twitter, because um, you show in this documentary not only how Twitter works and how Twitter could be used to help propel somebody into the presidency. How, how was that showing that? Because that's something really important, especially in our history, because everybody, and you pointed that out, presidents use television, radio, uh the internet and now with social media and this time it was used in this incident it was used by social media uh what were your thoughts on on that when you were finding everything out and figuring out that social how influ influential social media was 
Well, you're, you're right. I mean, no presidential election has ever won the same way twice. So as one of our interviews of uh, interview says, you know, you go back in time, you look at uh, presidential candidates that, that mastered radio, the master television, Barack Obama comes along and masters the internet, which, which don't forget when Barack Obama was running for office, smartphones didn't exist. So Donald Trump was the first new candidate to arrive in the era of smartphones. And so he used Twitter I'm of the belief that it was very experimental trial and error type of stuff. That's how I think most of that's a characteristic of his. And so he was playing around with this new thing and he found very quickly that it gave him the proximity to his, his followers in a way that he couldn't achieve by going through the mainstream media. And so uh, that was very, very successful connection uh, for him. The other thing, of course, were his rallies, which Barack Obama all held big rallies, but Trump used those rallies to try his new lines, try his new lines of attack, his new jokes, whatever it may be. So essentially, when he had an audience of 20,000 people. He was running a live focus group. And the same immediacy, the stand-up comedian knows straight away if a joke is going to you know, work or fall flat, he could learn what worked, what didn't, and take it on to the next rally. Uh, and that way, he seemed to be very in touch with voters because literally he was responding to the way they responded to him. Um, so combine that with Twitter, which obviously has a much larger reach than one rally, um, you have a very potent communication force, uh, which in 2016 worked perfectly for Donald Trump. I mean, you may come to the time in 2024, were he to run again, he wouldn't be using that trick, it would be something else. And again, a successful election anywhere on the planet is often based on using really creative solutions with the technologies uh, and, and media available at the time. Yeah. And I, and when you look at the documentary, and it kind of reminds me of this, is that he used also something that a lot of presidents have never really, when a lot of people who are running for president have really never used he used that divisiveness to help him. Yeah, uh, those that's right. Mentalities and those thoughts, especially with racial issues. Because in that time, and this is the way I look at it. This is my perspective when this all happened. Is the way I look at it is that minorities were coming up. Uh, a lot of educated minorities uh, were doing their thing, getting into that upper, that upper echelon that, that had never been done before. And there was a lot of people who didn't want to see that. And he used that to his advantage. And I don't know if I'm wrong in saying that, but that's something that I saw is that he used that for his advantage to get these people to, to really support him and say that they're taking their jobs and all this other messaging that he was doing. And it worked for him. It, it hit a nerve to some people. Yeah, I mean, you know, Van, Van Jones says it very well. And, um, it, a lot of people for whom racism isn't a problem, meaning, they can say they're not racist, but if other people are and it suits their gender, they're okay with it. So there was there was a sort of racism by proximity was a, an opinion put forth by certain people in in the film. Um, and of course, the other thing he did very successfully was ascribe nicknames to people that were demeaning. So you had uh, you had crooked Hillary, low Jeb, uh, low energy Jeb, Lion Ted, and so forth. And again. These were things that he discovered in the, for, the, the forum of uh, debates, uh, the, the initial Republican debates, but also rallies. And they stuck, and Frank Luntz, the pollster, explains in the film that by the time he'd used Little Marco, he realized this was very damaging to those candidates. And again, it was probably something he was just playing around with. He said it, he got a laugh, and he realized this kind of thing works. So on the, on the fly, on this election campaign, I've often described it as an open mic election campaign where you're saying and trialing things all the time, very subtly, but when things land and they work, you're then able to take it forward later the same day, at a rally the following day, but very, very accurately in touch with your base. Yeah, and this is one part of this documentary I really love as well, which goes into this is, you talk to Jerry Springer, and he said something that really stood out is the fact that this was entertainment. Yeah, that's, that's this right. wound up becoming. I'm, people went to his rallies to get to be entertained. It wasn't to learn about the candidate or to watch the debates to learn about what he has to do. No, it was entertainment. That's right, uh, and you know, and the media was complicit in a lot of this. You know, there's no question the entertainment factor that Trump provided, which is what's he going to say next. What rude thing is he going to accuse somebody of in the future? What could he possibly do 
tomorrow that could be worse than whatever he said today. That intrigue, a lot of people would deny being interested in it and amused by it and truthfully excited by it. That is reality TV and basic. And a lot of the media played along with that game. And Trump, every time he was on TV, had rising viewer figures and, and cable news was very, very incapable, in my opinion, of resisting the revenues that huge audiences bring. And Trump brought bigger audiences than anyone else in the Republican field, because frankly, he was far more entertaining. Yeah. And that's a good thing that you showed in the documentary as well, is the fact that all these news networks made money off of it. Yes. So it's kind of hard to not, you, you got to juggle that line of making money and being a journalist nowadays. And yeah. they took the money because it was making the money for because that, he was doing that. That's right. And we have moon of cbs saying precisely that you know trump may not be good for the country but damn good for cbs and there's you, you, you there's an explanation of the point yeah and that's the thing that i want to get your view on this because to me i think journalism's starting to break down where it's becoming since a few companies own a majority of the media outlets that you that you can control the media message. And we're seeing independent newspapers and independent sites starting to go down, especially after COVID. What are your thoughts about this? Because if you don't have an independent news media and independent voices, we may see this again. Well, uh, it's, a great, it's a great point because where I come from in the UK, it's actually illegal to have a broadcast network taking a political stance. So you have to, you know, if you have an interview with someone from the left, you have to have someone sitting from the right in the same studio for the same debate. Uh, I'm a great believer in balanced journalism. I think, I think anything that has an editorial direction or where the leadership of the network is leading journalists uh and pro and their programs in in, in a particular uh political direction i think is very unhelpful i mean on the other hand i'm not sure it's it's necessarily correct to say the fox news or cnn or msnbc dramatically drove the outcome of this election because they actually have incredibly low audience figures i mean they they rarely tip more than a million viewers in a country of 360 million people there's huge amounts of local news and of course social media is a big part of where people find their news these days so i one i think i think these networks like to portray themselves as very, very influential and quite enjoy the opprobrium they attract when everyone says they they're skewing the, the viewer figures but in fact i i don't buy that fox and fox news for example is attracting low trump supporters i think they're maintaining trump support but i'm not sure for example there are loads of people watching fox who last week were watching cnn um people seem to pick their team and stick with it so i'm not sure their influence is as great as they'd like us to think it is yeah exactly and uh with social media you bring up social media again i always felt like social media within the wrong hands could be used for something really really bad uh, being some guy who's a computer, I, who, I'm a, I have a degree in computer science, electronics, and knew a lot of the guys in the first, like for Friendster, who developed that and seen social media grow. Mm -hmm. That within the wrong, it's a great, it's great thought process, but it could lead to in the wrong hands, like what we've seen, could really cause a lot of damage, distress. Even like with this presidential campaign in 2016, it separated families with the thought process. And, and you show that. Yeah, I mean, social media, it, this, this again is where we are slightly balanced. I mean, we, we do expose the fact that the Clinton campaign was terrible on social media. Hillary Clinton had a panel supposedly of nine people to approve a single tweet. They didn't understand the value that it could bring in the same way that Donald Trump did understand the value. Um, yeah, I mean, I accept your point that it could be divisive, but I say any election at any time uh, favors the campaign that's the most wide awake and the most innovative and most frankly in touch with with the electorate at that time and i think on this in this area the clinton campaign is extremely weak trump i think was very lucky he, he stumbled upon a solution and it worked very well for him uh, but i don't personally think you can blame social media i 
think it is how each campaign used it but it was far more important uh because as we said in the past it was the internet that was used very effectively by Barack Obama who absolutely stole a march on John McCain raised a lot of money organized these huge rallies um and basically took advantage of the technology in a way that made him seem very in touch uh, as John McCain was at the time was looking very out of touch yeah yeah and just to get back into the documentary and the piece and what we're what we're talking about. Um, I was able to get into a Hillary Clinton rally in 2016 and cover it. And I remember, and this is just my point of view from what we, from, because it pertains to the documentary, it felt odd. I've never been to a rally where you've been like, feel like, it felt like Hunger Games a little bit and reminded me of that with Hillary, Hillary Clinton's rally. And I was, and I told people like, I'm not shocked if he would win. Yeah, because, because you, felt, you felt Hillary Clinton wasn't connecting. Yeah, she wasn't yeah. connecting. Like she almost, it was almost to a, an arrogance where she felt like I have this hands down. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, the feeling I got at the rally. Voters are very astute people. And again, it's like a very annoying thing and a lazy thing, in my opinion. People say, oh, voters who, people who vote such and such a way are stupid. Mm -hmm. Voters know whether or not they feel valued by their hand in it. And if they feel taken for granted, they resent it. Um, whether or not you are in favor of Trump, the long and the short of it was that he traveled the country and did more rallies and went to more cities and more locations than Hillary Clinton did all the way up to 1 a.m. On, on election night. And that in and of itself demonstrates a, a, a respect to, to the electorate. Now, I understand that a lot of people will say that's ridiculous. He was just he was just cynically trying to get their vote. But you have to show yourself and optics are everything in these campaigns to be wanting to do the hard work of going to visit people and voters really appreciate it when candidates come to the locales and connect with them. And, and this is again, is if, even if you hate Trump, you have to understand where he was successful in 2016. And that this is one very good example of where he was prepared to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's where when you break it down, because I'm not a big fan of him, I'll admit yeah. it. But when you look at history and you look at what presidential campaigns look like throughout history, this was the most unorthodox style of campaigning that I've ever well, the, seen. Well, the fact of the matter was he won. Mm -hmm. And so he did something right and yeah. he connected in a way and he found a way to connect in, in, in the same way that Hillary Clinton didn't connect. I mean, it said, it said at the end of the film, she never went to Wisconsin from uh in the in the period of time from the democratic convention until election day and again if you're in wisconsin that is not a compliment to you if somebody can't be bothered to come to your state and ask for your votes it's a very very straightforward lesson that anyone working on a campaign at any level in the future has to understand where trump was successful and they have to understand where the clinton campaign failed and there are a lot of lessons in this and they drive will drive outcomes and inform outcomes for a long period of time in, in electioneering. And it, 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 this is a history film fundamentally. And I've never heard an argument against knowing your history, because these are the lessons we learn from, you know, wars, all sorts of calamities in history. You have to know the detail to learn for the future. Exactly. And I agree with you on that, because I think if that whole saying, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. That's right. Is a real true statement. And I, and I, some people don't, that I've talked to don't think that and don't remember history. And it's like, these are the incidences that could occur again. And we have to learn about them, even though yeah. the hard, the hard discussions are always the ones that are the, yes, they're hard, but those are the ones that we got to learn from. But learning, the, the more facts you know, the more you can learn, as far as I'm concerned. So I think we're agreeing, you know, a lot of history is unpleasant. A lot of history, we, you know, is, reg is highly regrettable. But as you say, to avoid mistakes again, you have to understand why, why our forebears made, made the errors in the first place. Exactly, exactly. And uh, one topic I want to get into that's kind of like, because I could see I don't know if you're even thinking about it as maybe going into it and continue a little short continuation into the documentary and what happened throughout this last campaign. Uh, I'm sorry. What happened? Sorry, carry on. Oh, no. no, no sorry, carry on. If sorry. you're, oh, no problem. Uh, it's internet. We, we got to do what we can. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. um, 
would would you ever consider going back and looking at last year's campaign and trying because like you had mentioned it was a campaign that went through a, it was a presidential uh phase that was almost like a complete campaign and then we went to campaign mode again i i'm not sure that there is as huge as in, in the uh 2020 election i mean i, th it's, I think COVID was very damaging for donald trump it exposed that he didn't have the attention span and frankly the concern for a lot of people that he needed to have to, to be very successful in leading in leading the, the response to covid um i i say that in the 2020 campaign both his advocate and his own opponent in other words his own bad behavior made him you, you know was as damaging to hit to to him as his campaign was hurt to him uh, and very sadly the biden campaign realized this and largely kept Joe Biden at home. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, to my earlier point, you know, he hasn't toured all over the country, but I think the electorate understood that it wasn't viable to go around holding rallies and connecting with voters in the normal way. And so their decision was obviously entirely correct because he won. Um, but I don't think there were massive surprises in 2020. Um, I think 2024 could be a very different matter, but uh, I, I think 2020 Donald Trump campaign to win or lose, he blew it. That he lost, and and there's not a lot to analyze, quite frankly. Yeah. Well, the one thing I could definitely say, and we'll end it with that, because uh, this documentary was great. Thank I you so much, and so much more than what I even knew going into great. what I see. And that's the one thing I love about a documentary. If I learned something from it, it did its job. Thank you. It makes you see things in different lights. So James, you did a fantastic job. This is a documentary I think everybody needs to see because it will help them understand more about what happened and what's going on. Well, what's interesting, Michael, is clearly you're very interested in politics. And so if you're, if you're saying that, I'm, I'm delighted because you know, it's not just for people that are, that are you know, in, in by the game. It's for anyone interested in elections and democracy and how power is achieved. Um, because as I say, it's always a different thing, but the rules are fundamentally the same. Exactly. And being somebody, who, I've worked for the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> so I know how the whole thing works. My sister, I have family yeah. members who work for the family, for the mm -hmm. federal government. So it's like, and as I've gotten older, politics, you kind of, realize how much politics play into everybody's life and what's going on yeah. so i think that's why you have to learn and you have to know as much as you possibly can possibly can because that's right not be an expert but at least know what you're talking about and know what you're doing and uh, know how to move forward so james how can people watch the accidental president where is it on right now so it's on Apple TV, it's on uh, Amazon, and it's also on Google Play. So whatever platform you use, you're covered, um, and it's available right now. Cool. And we'll have a link on the bottom in the description where you could be able to watch uh, The Accidental President, because I, I'm telling you right now, this is definitely a documentary that you have to watch. I cannot say it enough because it's so insightful. Uh, James, thank you so much for being a part of Muse TV. I wish we could talk more into what happened in the presidency, but let's keep it to what the documentary is. But, Thanks, uh, Michael. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for watching Muse TV. We'll be back very soon with a new episode. So thank you very much. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell notification for all our new interviews, and we'll see you soon.